a great example of this is when you stand up for the very first time and you start to take a first step, you were delivered a very powerful stimulus if you get it wrong, such as falling. You fall on your butt and it kind of hurts. And that might, I may say, okay, whatever my brain just did to, um, to do that thing that hurts, well, let's not do that again. Let's do something different. Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Nick Housey with Modus Nova. I'm a licensed neurophysical therapist and neuroscientist helping brain injury survivors understand how to make functional gains after their injury. I hope this video helps you in your recovery. Uh, my name is Ajit and I'm from California. So uh, in 2019, I had a mild stroke, okay. which kind of created this side is a little bit hanging. And then also the, the foot on the left hand side, you know, that got affected more than right. Okay. And then probably I had the same problem in both the balance problem. So I'm looking for a solution so I, I can walk again. It's very difficult okay. to not able to walk. Understood. Now, um, so you said 2019. And tell me about your rehab sort of since 2019. Um, were you able to do rehab and how did that go? Uh, that time I was on straight Medicare. So okay. they set up an agency. They used to come at home and try okay. to give me exercise. But since okay. I was a very new patient, you know, it was hard for me to understand, but, you know, and immediately follow. Then mm -hmm. <clears throat> later on, you know, I went with the Humana and uh, like Medicare and Humana, then Medicare and Blue Cross. So they sent me to some physical therapy place and they did a lo lot of exercise at least three, four times. And then I tried to follow those exercises at home, you know, and I'm my doctor is asking me to go to a new physical therapy. But, you know, being there, it's a routine, you know, it doesn't help me personally, but I want to walk. So I was looking at other solutions and this one came up. So I wanted to know more about it. Sure. Yeah, happy to give you some insights. And uh, I just want to, first of all, thank you for giving me some background about kind of who you are. I know it's not a complete story, but it's it's at least helpful for me to kind of frame a discussion. And when it comes to how I can help, I can certainly help um, as being the chief scientist here to get, give you some insights into how the, in this case, the modus foot works um, and sort of the background scientific data, the clinical studies we've done and sort of um, just generally those types of things. Um, now, I, I very much want to frame a discussion based on what would be most useful for you. And so do you have more interest in understanding how the device itself works, kind of like the robotic interface, or are you more interested in understanding some of the, the scientific data and the clinical efficacy? I, I have some, one more thing to add. That, sure. um, before even a stroke, I had neuropathy. So that was okay. a problem. This one accentuated that problem. Sure. Now, you know, data is uh, it's okay, you know, but I'm looking at the device and I'm trying yep. to find out whether this will be helpful for me. Sure. Yeah. So, well, let me just give you a little bit of background here then. Um, and we can, we can deviate as you, as you wish. And so long story short, these robotic devices, there's one for the hand and there's one for the foot and the ankle. Um, they are designed on a concept of rehabilitation. That's kind of the gold standard for neuro rehab. And that is effectively what's called repetitive task practice. And repetitive task practice is, it's nothing fundamentally special insofar as we're really just trying to recapitulate the learning process. So it's the same thing that all of us did when we grew up in trying to learn a new task or if we learn to walk for the very first time, right? It takes a long time to learn how to walk. We don't appreciate that now being adults, but and it takes a lot of movements to establish those neural circuits and for us to then learn from the feedback that the environment gives us. A great example of this is when you stand up for the very first time and you start to take a first step, you were delivered a very powerful stimulus if you get it wrong, such as falling. You fall on your butt and it kind of hurts. And that might, I may say, okay, whatever my brain just did to, um, to do that thing that hurts, well, let's not do that again. Let's do something different. And what we're trying to do now is, you know, during the process of development, we establish these neural networks that allow us to do these tasks very, very reliably. Now, what happens is following a stroke or any neurologic injury, for instance, 
um, those networks get disrupted and their function gets disrupted. And what we have to do is we have to try to take the, the new sort of nervous system that you may have after neurologic injury and try to optimize it to get you the most function possible. And the way we have to do this is we have to kind of go back to how we develop and think through um, and do motions. And those motions are what will help actually drive the nervous system's response. Now, that's the kind of active medicine, if you will. Now, the, one of the other incredibly important aspects to that is not just to do the motions, but you have to be able to prioritize the motions that you do, whether or not they are good or bad. Hey, if you're finding this video helpful, please hit like and subscribe to help other brain injury survivors learn how Modus Nova is changing neuro rehab. And this is the concept that I talked about earlier about biofeedback. In the case of early in life, when we were learning how to do motions, that is the biofeedback is very easy for us to get because when you fall, it hurts and you, you, you learn not to do that again. Or for instance, if something may be a bit simpler, right? If I'm trying to pick up this cup of coffee and I miss the cup of coffee, that's, that's an immediate biofeedback, but I didn't do the motion correctly. And so fundamentally what we're trying to do is leverage those same processes and help people relearn to use their limbs. And we have to do this by going through hundreds or thousands of repetitions a day to actually cause a sufficient stimulation to the brain. And that's ultimately what, what leads to changes in our brain. And then hopefully that will then translate into changes in our function. And this is what these devices help us do. They help provide a couple, uh, three sort of critical components to that. One of them is that they actually, because following a stroke or an allergic injury, we often have difficulty completing a motion, regardless of whether or not it's good or bad. And so the devices here have the ability to help you move. And it does this through um, actuation. So it can help you actually move. The other really critical component here is that we have to get some information about the quality of those movements. For instance, am I moving in the correct direction that I want to be moving? And this is really important, especially for walking, right? You have to be able to push off your foot at the right time in order for you to get forward propulsion. Simultaneously, you also have to be able to bring up your toes at the appropriate time in order for you not to then catch them when you, when you move your limb forward. So being able to sequence those things is really important. And so these devices also have the ability to help sense your motions. And that can then be delivered and presented to you in a biofeedback sort of context, which is effectively a virtual environment. Um, I use the word virtual environment, but it's really just games. And we're just learning to play games and the sequencing of those games that you interface with your limb is what helps you relearn how to use that limb in an appropriate context. And this works on the, the lower extremity as well as the upper extremity. So the hand, and we, we focus on the foot and the ankle. And the reason we do this is we seemed, when we actually compare the um, interventions to the hand and the wrist and maybe interventions in the proximal muscles, we actually get kind of more bang for our buck. Same thing with the lower extremity too. Um, and so when we look at the evidence, specifically in your case, if you're interested in the, in the modus foot, the things that we watch in these clinical trials is very, very important, very salient thing, and that is walking. And so we evaluate people's walking endurance, which is a, a critical component, and we evaluate their walking speed. Now, walking speed, it may not seem super important, but walking speed is a really important biomarker for your balance and your stability and your ability to, to be effectively ambulating in the community. A great example of this is um, most lights, um, traffic lights, for instance, when you try to cross the street, there's a fine amount of time for you to, to, to traverse that street. And you have to be able to walk at a sufficiently fast pace or to get across that. Um, and so walking speed is a really good biomarker for a lot of different things. And when we look at following a three month intervention of the modus foot, where people are doing about an hour, an hour and a half a day, five days a week for about three months, um, we see people improve their walking endurance by between 30 and 50% which is a non-insignificant amount of walking, um, increased walking um, endurance. Um, and so that's like, if, for instance, going from, you know, a couple hundred meters to, you know, 50% uh, more than that. Uh -huh. And in terms of walking speed, this actually, the way we quantify this in a clinical side is we actually have sort of buckets. There are sort of um, stages where people actually can advance past. And those go based on walking speeds and their break points at around 0.8 meters per second and there's another break point at above one meter a second. And when you go above those certain categories, you actually reduce what's called the relative risk ratio of you falling 
or being able to be a better community ambulator. And when we evaluate people, their walking speed, it actually bumps people up of what's called a functional category. And so for instance, if they were walking at a, what's called a um, home ambulator status, they're able to now walk in the community and be safe with that. And so we're able to monitor these things. And so um, I just wanted to kind of give you some of the background and also some of what the, the evidence and what kind of things you can expect based on the clinical data. Yes. Uh, does it help to balance the uh, foot also to, to be able yeah, to so, spend? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when we think about um, how we generate balance, one of the most important ways that we sort of maintain our balance when we're standing, there's, there's a, a hip strategy, a knee strategy, and an ankle strategy. And the ankle is a, is a critical component to being able to stay upright. And so if you look at the modus, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but... Um, it can move into plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. So plantar flexion is the motion that if you're in a car and you press the gas pedal or press the accelerator, that's plantar flexion. And when you lift off the gas pedal, that's what's called dorsiflexion. Now, that's great, but that's a single planar motion. Um, in order to be able to improve your balance, you have to be able to operate outside of those motions and what are called off sagittal movements. And so when we, when we think about the modus foot, it has the ability to work on dorsiflexion, inversion, plantar flexion and eversion. So it works on all sort of multidimensional movements. All of those are really critical components to help you maintain your balance and your stability. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I just gave a bunch of information there to you, um, Ajit. Now, do you have any sort of questions that emerge from that um, brief discussion? Okay. Well, one of the thing is, other person is speaking, they need to unmute. Yeah, um, that's okay. Um, Reggie, are okay. you are you okay, Reggie? Yeah. Okay, the the device looks pretty simple. Like it's just a up mm -hmm. and down movement. Am I missing something? Yeah, interesting question. So um, there's a reason it is simple. Um, when we think about other robotic devices, and in fact, our earlier versions of um, our robotic devices back 15 years ago were actually full exoskeletons, where you had six joints going across the upper extremity, um, scapula, shoulder, elbow, wrist, finger motions. And what it comes down to is that um, those things become exceptionally costly. And they're very, very complex to put on. And in fact, it might take two cl um, clinicians or two technicians to actually put something on. And so early on in our decision-making, we realized that making a device simple and easy to use is a critical component to helping people get better. And so what we do now is we have a modular approach. We have devices that go across single joints. And um, that way it reduces the cost and it increases the access. That's one of the big things for us is, yeah, we can make a, a you know, half million dollar robotic exoskeleton, but it might be able to help, you know, only a handful of people. And when, especially too, when we look at the actual data, um, the data is less convincing that multi-joint um, exoskeletons are superior in their efficacy to single joint um, or reduced joint um, um, constructions. And so um, I think the better thing is mostly, can we get people access to devices that will help them move? Um, and I think by nature, having a simpler system to help them in their home is the, is the biggest, uh, biggest way to, to, to help. And so, no, it is intentionally designed to be simple to use. Yes, and simple and, and, and less complex. Okay, uh, so are there different devices for hip and thigh mm. and calf and ankle? Interesting. So right now, the foot and ankle device is the modus foot. We are actively working on devices for the other extremities or the other joints of, across the segments. Um, so yeah, you you are well along the line of, of being correct in terms of our process. It's a matter of we had that device originally because when we focus on a distal extremity, we get more bang for our buck than we work on, on proximal. So that's why we focus there to start with, and then we're working our way up the kinematic chain. Okay. Thanks for watching this video. If you have questions or would like to speak with me about how you can make functional gains from home, call or text me at 404-939-3476 or visit modusnova.com slash contact.